So let's now move on to gene editing technologies. And so now we'll basically pivot to uh, genome editing technologies. So although most of the remainder of the lecture will be talking about CRISPR-Cas9, uh, it's worth kind of going through the brief history of uh, gene editing technologies that have been used to date. So one of the first approaches that people uh, use to uh, do gene editing is site-directed mutagenesis via PCR. And so the general the broad idea here is that um, in typical PCR, what you're doing is you're using like a pair of primers, for example, that either anneal to the ends of a fragment you're trying to amplify, or in the case of a circular plasmid, you're using primers that anneal to the same starting position, uh, but run in opposite directions uh, on the plasmid as shown in step zero. And so the principle of site-directed mutagenesis is that you really only need like a primer really only needs about 11 base pairs of complementary sequence in order to find its target and anneal. And so if you, want to, if you want to introduce a mutation, what you can do is you can introduce it into the primer by designing a primer where 11, about 11 base pairs uh, or more of sequence is complementary on either side of the mutation you're trying to introduce. And uh, if you do that, then basically your primer will anneal uh, and introduce the mutation into one of the copies that's made out of that plasmid. And so after a few rounds of PCR um, and after some template removal using uh, something like DPN1, uh, which will only cut uh, the original template uh, and not your PCR copies, um, then basically you'll end up with a population where that mutation has basically been introduced where, um, where the primer was. And so uh, through kind of a similar approach, you can introduce uh, deletions by basically, uh, you know, from the standpoint of a circular plasmid, you can design your primers such that uh, they don't essentially start at the same position, but there is a gap between them. And so if you think about this hard enough, basically you'll realize that after a few, again, after a few rounds of PCR amplification, um, that gap between the starting points on the two primers will basically be absent from almost all of the uh, PCR copies that you have in your population. Uh, similarly, you can do an insertion by designing a, one of the primers such that uh, part of the primer anneals to the starting position as it should have, uh, but there's an extra uh, there's an extra bit of sequence on the five prime end that initially doesn't uh, anneal to the uh, template. But after a few rounds of PCR amplification, most of the amplicons will also have that extra uh, piece of sequence that doesn't initially uh, that doesn't that isn't initially complementary to anything on the template strand. So another classic approach to gene editing is uh, homologous recombination based methods. And so the broad goal of HR based uh, gene editing is to replace a target genetic locus uh, with a homologous genomic sequence that does two things, one of which is disrupt, for example, the coding sequence of a gene that you're trying to disrupt. And number two, introduce positive and negative selection markers that allow you to then identify successful uh, homologous recombination. And so key to the HR-based methods is obviously identifying a hopefully long target region on your genome of interest, uh, like the first exon of a coding gene that you want to disrupt. And so once you've identified that target region, uh, Suppose that you divide that target region into two consecutive parts, which we'll call here segment A and segment B, where each segment for this to work, for HR uh, has to work, basically has to be at least around 2 kV uh, length. Although I think in practice, you'll see that uh, people use about 6 to 14 kV uh, more typically. And so then with the segment A and segment B in hand, you can then design a targeting construct, uh, which will consist of segment A and segment B. Uh, but this time you're uh, in the targeting construct, you separate these two segments by the coding sequence of some drug selection marker, for example, like neomycin phosphotransferase or NeoR. Um, and it's also you also typically flank uh, either segment A or segment B by some negative selection marker like HSVTK. And so once you introduce uh, the targeting construct into the cell, uh, you get uh, basically through two homologous recombination events, uh, the targeting construct uh, gets inserted into the homologous genetic locus. Um, and so what's going to happen is that 
upon successful integration, uh, the NeoR gene is basically going to confer resistance to neomycin. So neomycin is just a, some compound that uh, interferes with protein synthesis uh, in eukaryotic cells. And so uh, when you have successful integration, then you're going to prevent action of neomycin. Um, it's also common to use to, to apply negative selection uh, through this HSV-TK or uh, what stands for HSV uh, thymidine kinase. Uh, and so what the, so the idea here is that what you're trying to prevent is random integration of your targeting vector uh, into the genome. And so the idea is that if you have random integration of your targeting vector uh, into the genome, uh, what's going to happen is that you should tend to have an intact HSV TK gene. And so what that means is that um, when you apply, which when you then apply drugs like gancyclovir, uh, those compounds are going to inhibit DNA synthesis. But the key part here is that they only work when they get phosphorylated by HSV TK. And so those drugs will only kill cells for which successful HSV TK integration has happened. Um, it's worth noting that even when you uh, use positive and negative selection, uh, you can still have random integrants uh, after negative selection because your HSV TK might be inactivated uh, through other means like um, partial deletions or so on. Um, and so random homologous recombination in general is not efficient. Uh, generally speaking, one in a million cells uh, results in like a successful HR product. And so the next few methods that we talk about, uh, mainly CRISPR-Cas9, uh, what they do is they leverage um, the double-stranded break and repair systems uh, in cells. So the basic idea is that you use uh, you introduce a double-stranded uh, break in your genome using a programmable nucleus that somehow is targeted to that region. And after the double-stranded DNA break happens, uh, basically one of two uh, DNA repair pathways is used to then kind of introduce uh, some kind of mutation in the genome. Uh, either you can use non-homologous end joining, uh, which basically results in random insertions or deletions at the target locus. Um, or if you supply some kind of single-stranded DNA or double-stranded DNA donor, uh, you can then use the homology-directed repair pathway, uh, which then leads to kind of very precise uh, editing of, uh, of a specific locus. And so an important point is that double-stranded uh, DNA repair systems uh, basically lead to 10 to 100 times more efficient transformation uh, than HR-based methods. So double-stranded uh, break-based gene editing systems really require three components. Uh, the first of which is you need a nucleus that can obviously cut uh, double-stranded DNA. Uh, you need a DNA binding domain that uh, the effector nucleus is tethered to. So basically the idea is the DNA binding domain brings the nucleus in close proximity to its uh, target sequence. And you need some way of actually targeting a specific piece of DNA um, so either through uh, TF recognition domains or guide RNAs. And so, uh, yeah, one example of like an effector nucleus would be like FOC1. So FOC1 is a classic kind of restriction enzyme that uh, contains, the endogenous version of FOC1 contains both a DNA binding domain and a DNA cleavage domain. Um, but typically the uh, DNA binding domain is replaced with some kind of custom recognition domain like a bunch of zinc fingers that uh, are designed to recognize specific sequences. And so the kind of precursor methods to CRISPR-Cas9 uh, were really zinc finger and talon-based uh, editing systems. And so the idea of these zinc finger and talon-based systems is that uh, they actually use like protein-based DNA recognition domains uh, to confer sequence specificity of the editing. Uh, so basically the idea is that uh, you'd have like a pair of FOC1 domains, uh, which are basically tethered to DNA binding um, protein units. And so zinc fingers basically, uh, so zinc finger based approaches uh, use combinations of domains where each individual domain recognizes a triplet of nucleotides. Whereas for talons, uh, basically your uh, recognition domains only recognize single nucleotides. Um, and so I, I think one of the main reasons that uh, both zinc fingers and talons were kind of eclipsed by CRISPR-Cas9 is that uh, 
uh, basically it's it's much easier to design guide RNAs. And so we'll talk about what exactly guide RNA is, but basically CRISPR-Cas9 and similar systems are based on you designing like an RNA that's complementary uh, to, to your target sequence. Whereas when you design zinc fingers and talons, you have to build essentially new proteins every time you want to uh, target a new sequence. And so it's, it's much more laborious than CRISPR-Cas9. Um, there's also problems with delivering these huge protein domains, these huge protein complexes uh, into cells, um, whereas delivery for CRISPR-Cas9 potentially is a little bit easier. Um, just like with CRISPR, uh, as we'll talk about later, um, there's some of the problems, some of the other problems with zinc fingers and talons are that uh, you sometimes, it's sometimes hard to predict uh, off-target effects uh, because of lack of precise sequence specificity.